Welcome to 2020 Politics War Room. I'm Al Hunt. My partner, James Carville, is down in New Orleans. Subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. First, a happy holidays. Merry Christmas to everyone, even Jim Jordan. Uh, and J- James, this is a, a season of faith, the birthday of Christ, but it's for everyone. It is a season, it should be at least, a season of joy. And we have special, a special reason or reasons to be joyful because of our spouses. As the late Bob Novak said, they were kind enough to let us keep our maiden names. But we have (laughs) Mary Madeline and Judy Woodruff here. Thank you both for being with us. It is great to be here with the three of you. I'm so excited to be joining you. Holly jolly, kids. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's start off. Rather than talk about, you know, the heavy stuff, which is too heavy, Mary, how did the Madeline Carville spend Christmas? Well, it depends on where LSU and or the Saints are in the football lineup. So (laughs) this year we are going to have a quiet Christmas in anticipation of celebrating the Tigers, go Tigers! <laughs> and our famous soon, our famous Heisman Trophy winner, Joe Burrow. Thank you, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, you see, one of the things, we, we go to my sister's house, which is in where I grew up, but an hour, 10 minutes from, from New Orleans, and Christmas Day is pretty quiet. Sometimes we like to have spaghetti and meatballs on Christmas Day. <laughs> you know, they, every place has a different, has different Christmas and holiday traditions, and New Orleans and Louisiana is obviously no exception. But one thing I never experienced until we moved here was the, were these bonfires. I would ask James to elaborate on them, but they are bonfires on the levee, two stories high. What's the history? It's St. James Parish. Yeah, it, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, they, it's this cultural thing, and they light the bonfires on the levee because it's supposed to on Christmas Eve, so it guides Santa so he can find everybody's house, and. You should just go online, and they'll have a camera of the St. James Parish bonfires, and they've been doing it forever. And and the tradition is just one of these things that it's gotten bigger and bigger as you go forward. I mean, some of these things are quite elaborate. You know, Santa needs a light to guide him here because we're the only state that has a drive-by daiquiri stand. So I think (laughs) he probably needs a designated driver when he's coming through Louisiana. So I am... I am dying to ask this question. Judy Woodruff is up. I, I think the, the most prominent female journalist maybe ever in American history. What is your favorite Christmas carol? Oh, my golly. I wish I'd thought about that ahead of time. There are so many of them. Well, that's why I wanted to just kind of hit you and get off the top of your head. You know, I am a sucker for all the – I love everything from silver bells to jingle bells to I'm dreaming of a white Christmas to – you know the 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 hymns we sing at church on Christmas. I love all of that. In fact, I'm one of those people who likes to start listening to Christmas songs at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Not that you have any choice, <laughs> Mary. I will quickly tell you that one time my wife told me to stop singing in church. I, I'm, I, I'm not exactly known for being able to carry a tune. Uh, when your kids were younger, Mary, did you uh, have special, um, uh, you know, special things you did that day? Was there a, a routine, a ritual, or what? Well, as y'all know, and probably most of everybody who's listening, who are all our friends, and we had our kids late, so I was so didn't know how to be a mother. For Maddie's first Christmas, we had a thirty-foot high. Christmas tree and I handmade every ornament. Oh my gosh! Whoa! And this to this day, she holds it up as my highest triumph for her. <laughs> wow! <laughs> she doesn't remember a thing, but you know the stuff you do for your kids because it is, it is. You you're so right. It is for family, and it's so weird when the, you guys are experiencing this too. When your kids, your kids would rather not be with you on Christmas. Now, it's not that they'd rather not be with you, but they start bringing home boyfriends and girlfriends and friend friends, and it just expands. Christmas joy expands. Well, Christmas is our, is at least my favorite uh, day of the year, I think. Judy, I, with some trepidation, uh, I ask you <laughs> to tell James and Mary about our, our Christmas ritual, Christmas Day ritual. Well, the truth is we live in Washington, D.C., and the truth is that we borrow our Christmas tradition 
from uh, mainly from the Hunt household when Al Hunt was growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. But it involves waiting until pretty late to get the tree. We often don't get the tree until about a week before Christmas. It's always a live tree. It's not 30 feet, Mary, but we try to get one that almost touches the ceiling. And we've got a, a couple of angels we alternate every year putting on the top. I've never made an ornament. I'm in awe of you for making the ornaments for the tree, but we've collected ornaments over the year over the years. And we, you know, that's a big deal for us. But on Christmas morning, um, the ritual is the children come down, we have breakfast. Santa has mysteriously and amazingly left a lot of interesting items in everybody's stocking. And we go around the table after we eat breakfast and everybody can open the stocking. We don't, we never let the children, even though they are now all in their 30s. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they are not allowed to, they're not allowed to go into the living room to look <laughs> at what Santa brought. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's just such a great tradition. And they there's, were, a, there's they funny stuff us. in the stockings, which Mr. Hunt is usually responsible for. The other thing that happened, Mary, in 1986, one of Judy's dearest friends is Andrea Mitchell. They worked together at NBC, so she invited her to spend Christmas breakfast and Christmas Day with us, and which was great. And the next year, Andrea called and said, "Can I bring my boyfriend?" And we said, "Sure." We, did, you know, her boyfriend was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. So <laughs> we have gone now for 32 years. We have Christmas morning with Alan Greenspan and Andrea Mitchell. And when he was at the pinnacle of his power, <laughs> there was nothing more fun than to make fun of him. <laughs> we would we would get him things like a full size picture, a blow up of Paul Volcker, and uh, he is really quite a good sport and puts up with all this. So we have fun. He's irrationally exuberant, is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for all, he's a man of irrational exuberance for all seasons. Are you remind Judy? You reminded me of a funny two funny stories about James. We only had that thirty foot Christmas tree once because y'all have been to the farm. We have that great room, and it was stupid. When I say made it for the whole tree, I only covered half the tree. But we decided we want to get a pet, have a fresh tree. So you know James, and you know how athletic and mechanical and <laughs> jockey he is. We go out to this field to cut our own tree with complete with a saw oh, and an no. extra. Remember this, honey? We were out there for five minutes. He goes, "It's too damn cold." <laughs> <We just went laughs> oh no! <laughs> he goes, "Can't you just buy one fully decorated?" <laughs> like, go to Costco and get one. <laughs> I, I just for us. For me, anyway, I, I love this time of year down here because, you know, it's, it's the weather's generally pretty good. And there's always, you know, particularly this year with LSU being good and the Saints, you know, going to the playoffs and you know, I mean, just a lot of excitement. And uh, New Orleans does Christmas pretty well. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a big deal out here. It's a very Catholic culture, so it, it, that people tend to decorate more than, than other places. It's a really cool time of year down here. You want to hear a juvenile story that James does every Christmas? He mentioned going to his sisters. He's James is one of eight, and those eight had 47 kids, oh, and gosh. those 47 kids <laughs> now have over 75 kids, and we all jam into his sister's house. And when I say screaming kids in, <laughs> in, a, in a smallish house, so James starts this chant, <laughs> which is, should we eat? Should we pray? Should we sing? <laughs> To hell with it. What do you say? He makes all I would say, look, one of of the kids were late. I said, should we wait and defer our pleasure and have our presence later or just say to hell with him, open up? And it it starts screaming to hell. I said, wait a minute. The priest here, Father, what what would Jesus, what would the baby Jesus want us to do? They want us to defer our pleasure and bring our whole family together. And they would just get these crazed looks. No, no, no. Two and three year olds screaming, to hell with him, to hell with him. He's such a leader in his family. Well, you you guys have a mob at Christmas. We don't have quite that big a group, but we do manage to have a lot of fun. And over the years, we've invited friends to to join us. I mean, I remember when our kids were little, we would always take them to the service on Christmas Eve. It was what, Al, usually at four o'clock? Five o'clock, yeah. Five o'clock in the afternoon. And they would have live animals there. The children were encouraged to dress up as shepherds and everything you can imagine uh, that has to do with the nativity. And it was great fun watching these kids just wander all around. You know, this is all sounding so idyllic. This goes to the same 
uh, type of story as, as, as James cutting down a Christmas tree. We started a date in 1977. Oh, I was going to tell that okay, story. Okay, you go, go ahead. No, 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 you, you go no, ahead. No, no, you you're, go ahead you're and tell it. All right, so I, I, Al and I had been dating, I don't know, what, about a, a year maybe? Almost. Almost a year, and Christmas was coming, and I knew Al to be this very sweet-tempered, <laughs> um, uh, mild-mannered uh, gentleman Long story short, I had just bought a house in a neighborhood called Cleveland Park, and we had chosen this this Christmas tree, live tree, and Al is dragging it up the stairs. There are about 20 stairs. He gets to the front door, and the tree, the bottom of the tree, is coming in the door first, meaning in this narrow front door, he's trying to get the branches. The branches are wide, and they don't fit. I mean, you would normally bring the tree in from the top. And and I saw the the formerly pleasantly uh, disposed mild mannered Al Hunt turn into somebody who uh, couldn't figure out what to do and wasn't willing, shall we say, to take a suggestion about backing <laughs> off and to bringing the tree in the opposite direction. <laughs> oh, what a surprise! <laughs> but our relationship survived. Al well, was that 1978? I guess 77. It, it was it was great training for the next 42 years. Uh, from now on, uh, or not now on because he wasn't even born, but starting about 25 years ago, we have Benjamin put up the Christmas tree every year because I yeah. can't do it. But the, the, the other thing we do is, and we, this was great when the kids were younger, we, we go to Vail. And the great stick was to have, have, have Christmas breakfast, uh, have a wonderful time, get in a, a car or a little van, around 12 o'clock, go to Dulles Airport, get in an airplane and fly to Denver. And when the kids are four, seven, eight, ten, it they have their presents, they're happy, and rather than being a pain in the neck around the house, they just slept in the plane. So it was a it was a, it was a nice way to end Christmas Day, and we're going to do it again this year. Except they're not four, seven, eight, and ten. You know, you reminded me of a great story about weird, the weird world in which we all live or have lived. After nine eleven, I had to spend the next two years in an undisclosed, secure location, which meant I always had to be with Dick Cheney wherever he was. So we had to go to to that at that time. The undisclosed, secure location was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The kids were four and seven. James hates the cold. <laughs> we had, and I, as you can, my previous story indicated, I am a Christmas freak. The vice president, they had a dead head, the uh, Air Force Two there. So he let me bring all my Christmas ornaments, all my presents, and the advance team got us a Christmas tree and they were all young single men. You know what advanced men are? <laughs> we walk in, there's this Charlie Brown tree. I've dragged all this stuff wow. cross country and my kids and the tree had like three little branches. <laughs> <laughs> it was 30 degrees below zero. Oh my and there was, God. there was 14 feet of snow. The kid, Emerson, walked out the front door and went into 14 feet of snow. We couldn't find her. It was unbelievable. And James just regaled all those crazy Republicans <laughs> with Boudreaux and Maker's Mark stories. <laughs> I, oh, I love it. I love it. But it does sound like uh, Jackson or wherever you were gets colder than Vale. <laughs> Vail gets pretty cold. It was cold. I, mean, I don't know if it does, but it was. I tell you what, I don't know if it was cold in a lot of places that day. You know, I'll tell <laughs> you. I'll tell you one nice story about our time. Our time uh, in Vail, uh, when, as you both know, uh, our son, our oldest son Jeffrey, was injured uh, and and can't walk. And one of the first reactions he had was, "I'll never be able to ski again. I'm so sad." And our friends out there said, of course he can ski. And we take him every year, and he does adaptive skiing out there, and he skis the whole mountain. I mean, literally, the oh, back bowls, yeah, he does wow. everything on a sit oh, ski. Wow. And that it's one of the great highs, I think, of his it year. Is. I mean, he just he can't wait to get out to Vail on Christmas Day. Oh, Jeff, is, Jeff, it's it's so cool. And they, the adaptive ski program they have at Vail, and frankly, at so many ski resorts, now has opened up this sport to people uh, with uh, including war, wounded war mm -hmm. uh, uh, wounded warriors veterans we see a lot of them uh, in Vail and and know that they ski but for Jeff it's just the highlight of of the year I think well, that's the highlight of the show no one has ever complained it's, it's a great story it's very uplifting yeah. you know it, because he can be on the mountain with us the entire uh, day. I mean, as long as we're out there, he can be out there with his instructor or two, or, or two instructors. That is so awesome. And he's awesome. such a it sweet, is. such a sweet kid. How does that work? Like, what do you just 
because I used to, I grew up in the Midwest and I ski and I could put James on adaptive skiing. Otherwise, I don't know what he would do. No, he can't. I'm not going to play Molly. Just for people, like spread the good word on this. How does that work? You just call up and say, do you have an adaptive ski program? Yeah. Most do. Yeah, most do. And it, I mean, what, and they have different device, different I don't know, mechanical devices. I don't know what other term to use for different. I mean, we see blind skiers in Vail. They wear they wear a um, a banner, uh, a little like an apron, a bib rather, that shows, that says blind skiers. So you know they're on the mountain. They're obviously all skiing with someone. And we see skiers with one leg. We've seen, I mean, in Jeffrey's case, because he can't stand on his own, he sit, it's a sit ski. It looks a little bit like a small sled. And he goes down the mountain with a, and one instructor behind him holding a tether, a, a rope. And Jeffrey leans left and right and goes down. And then the other instructor skis ahead so to sort of make sure nobody's, you know, ahead. But they go very fast. And they do blue and even groomed black runs. Wow. It's, it's really, really extraordinary and, and just uh, gives everybody a lift. You know, I, I tell you what, I, I wrote a column one time because Vail, Colorado is supposedly the playground of the rich and privileged is the most, you know, really it is the most, uh, you know, disabilities accessible place I've ever been. And we've been over to the U.S. Naval uh, Marine Corps Stadium because our nephew played, played lacrosse against Navy. And it was really awful. It wasn't. It was, it was not at all disabilities friendly. And so I wrote a column talking about this contrast and <clears throat> the column was read by senator john Sidney mccain you know the next year u.s navy marine corps stadium was very disabilities friendly yeah you would think that that a, a, sta- a stadium that has military i mean it kind of a you know, there's a lot of disabled people that served in the military to put it mildly i think i think i think john mccain made that yeah, point I probably more emphatically yeah, than i'm making it now well so I so I have a question for Mary. You know, Mary, you and I have a lot of a lot of friends, a lot of girlfriends we talk to, but I have to say these two guys we are married to, I think they talk not only at least once a day, maybe several times a day. We have been in China uh uh with uh you know on a on a thousands and thousands of miles and Al will be on the phone with James. And Al will, frankly, be using his Louisiana accent when he talks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Mary, my question is, do you have any idea what they talk about? Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> our paths do not cross that often during the day. But I have never been in the car with one Chester James Carville that he's not been on the phone with Mr. Albert Hunt there. They are worse than any girls. And I don't know about you, Judy, but the older I get, the less I like talking on the phone. Just give me a text. That's how we communicate with the kids. I don't like it's just too bothersome for me to get on the phone. It's he talks to Al six times a day. He talks to George Stephanopoulos every day, Rom every day. He's he's got like all he does is yabber on the phone all day. I'm waiting for him to start doing his nails and getting facials. And it's the most girly girl thing I've ever. And, you know, they don't really talk about anything. They just sort of gossip. I swear, Judy, it's like it was gossip that the likes of which you would never spend your brain power doing. Well, uh, I'll occasionally hear Al mention a poll number or something that he saw. Or in- written down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or or they may mention sports. You know, they do. May. May. We t- may. We may. Yeah. Men- may. I'm, the Washington Nationals. I am very I- grateful for Al's friendship to James because James is a somewhat of an addictive and, a, and obsessive personality. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> but Al really fulfills his sports junkie dumb. They talk a lot about sport. Yesterday, I mean, recently you spent a lot of time talking about the Heisman Trophy. They've been on it's this football journey now for like yeah. we 50 a, we times a, a day. Ride this year. Woo, man. Well, the nice thing, Mary, we had that incredible baseball season Ooh, like no one has like ever had man. before. History. And and then right after that was over, and 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 having withdrawal symptoms, James right away got into LSU. He's been been in LSU before, but what a season! And I remember James Carville last January after that contra- that not, not wasn't controversial call. It was that terrible call in the playoff game. And he said, Albert, <laughs> this is my Louisiana. Accent. He said, Albert, I tell you, Louisiana is just jinx. They're out to get us. We're never going to get a fair break. It's just awful, Albert. It's just you know we're we're, we're doomed. They all hate us. 
And, you know, since then, I would point out there's LSU and the Heisman Trophy winner. The Saints are going to the playoffs, and the Pelicans got Zion Williamson. James, I don't think they hate you. Look, Mary had watched the Saints a lot more, but she watched the Georgia game. And she watched the whole game, and she calls me and says, you know, Joe Barra, he's really good. I mean, he's really good. I said, yeah, he's really, really he's good. He's making me sound like a dunce. But for all of your listeners, this is a once-in-a-lifetime quarterback. That's all I have to say. And I've incre- I'm increasingly associating winter, particularly since we're in a warmer climate here, with these winter sports. And I'm not – I knew who Joe Burrow was and what he was doing. Is from Ohio. But that Georgia game, I've never – it was like ballet. He could have been doing – the swan. He, I mean, it was the most beautiful thing. I love athleticism and I don't want to get anywhere near politics, but it's a place you can go and be completely root for your home team and your people. And I, it's not this way everywhere, but I grew up in Chicago and it was like that here, but there, but even more in Louisiana and New Orleans and Baton Rouge. The entire community's lives or are organized around the football season. And everybody, the way the schedule works is you go to LSU on Saturday, you go to the church on Sunday, and you go to the Saints on Sunday afternoon. And it's it's the perfect, perfect holiday and post-holiday weekend uh, period of time. And then as soon as that ends, you go right into Mardi Gras. Uh, and it sounds like, Mary, you are a much more supportive uh, sport spouse than uh, than I am to Al. Al Al counts on my companionship during uh, nationals during baseball season uh, because I do love the nationals. I'm not as as uh, hot on football as he is. And then in basketball season, you know, my beloved Duke Blue Devils, uh, I do pay attention to to college basketball. Well, I would just say, Mary, I may not be <laughs> Joe Burrow, but you wait a you wait a Zion Williamson starts playing down there. He is a phenom, <laughs> the likes of which few people yeah, we'll have something. ever seen. He is. I can't wait. We need him fast too. I should be back in a couple of weeks. Well, you and, guys yeah. will appreciate this. Our, I, he is magnificent, extraordinary, yeah. once in a lifetime player in anybody's life. But in this particular case, our baby girl is. This is her senior year. Oh. So she's had nothing but great LSU teams. And this is so this is her last game she went to. And during finals, they said, how are you doing? She goes, well, I'd be doing a lot better if I didn't go to the Georgia game. But I would I would never give that up in my entire life. I don't care what my GPA is. I said, oh, hang on for your dad, honey. Yeah, they go. They go to the they go to the game. Also, and and the, the girls, all, they'll go together. I mean, they they. Follow them. They went to Austin. They went to Nashville for the Vanderbilt game. They went to Georgia for Atlanta for the Georgia game. I mean, they they travel. They went to Alabama. Look, you guys have you guys have LSU and the Saints. Uh, I'm stuck with the Washington Redskins and my beloved alma mater, Wake Forest. And I love Wake Forest, but they're not exactly a football power. So the only one that's yeah, they're going to the bowl. Yeah, they're going to the bowl. I know the, they're a good bowl, but they're going to pinstripe the pinstripe bowl. bowl. I know. <laughs> uh, Ju- Judy does get – she gets crazed in Duke basketball games, though. She can say that she's blasé about this, but when Duke plays basketball, she yeah. is she is crazed. I get, I get teased a lot, Mary and James, by our children, especially our son Ben, who lo- – who follows sports as 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 his father does, and who teases that the only thing I know how to say at a game is "Go Duke." <laughs> oh, wait, it wait. doesn't get much more complicated than that. I, Mary, I have to tell you one more James Carville story. In two thousand and two, uh, he came up with an absolutely fabulous idea. Let's go to Las Vegas mm-hmm. uh, for this prize fight, De La Hoya against Vargas. And as I recall, uh, you got us great tickets. And we went out with Paul Begala, and I took, and we took my 15-year-old son Benjamin. And I said, "Give me a little while because it's not going to be easy to persuade Judy to let him go to Vegas for a for a prize <laughs> fight." So he said, "Fine." So the next day, he did Inside Politics on CNN. Now, Al, watch the language and, there. And yeah. he said, "Judy," he said, "I'll tell you." He says, "Benjamin in Vegas, boxing, booze, broads. What more could a boy want?" <laughs> <laughs> it, it set back the cause for I, a few I, days. I was horrified, but he still went. Al had already cooked this thing up, right. and there was no no talking him out I, of it. I always encourage young people to get in the vice early because you got more time to enjoy it. <laughs> It'd be terrible to pick up that later. But whatever. What a great show, guys.
this is this is terrific. Listen, both of you, uh, not only a merry merry Christmas, but go Tigers! Uh, a great trip to Atlanta. Yep. Uh, and and, uh, and the happiest of New Year's. Merry we love Christmas you both. to all our we, put it we, day. we miss. We are, We wish you the merriest of Christmases. Thank you. Both of both of you. Thank Back you so you. much. Here we are on the eve of Christmas, and who better to talk to than Christy Numbers Harvey? Hey, guys. Happy holidays. I know it is the Christmas season uh, and the winter holiday season, but I've got a scary number for you this week, and that number is 115.6 million. And that is the number of Americans who are going to hit the road traveling for the holidays uh, between Christmas and New Year's, 115.6 million. Um, It's the most in the 20 years since AAA has started tracking those numbers and is up from 4% last year, which I already thought was pretty horrific. And the reason I personally care about this is uh, my husband and I, for Christmas each year, Uh, just give each other uh, as a present uh, a little vacation between the week between Christmas and New Year's. So we are going to be one of those 115.6 million people hitting the road. And uh, I'm terrified. Time to rethink the gift, I think. James, tell them where you're going to be going. I'm going to be hitting the road myself. I'll be going to Atlanta for a little dust up, a football game between Oklahoma and my fighting tigers of LSU. So I'll be joining the 156 million motoring up to Atlanta. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I um, I will not be joining those on the highway, but we will be getting an airplane on Christmas Day and coming back on New Year's Day. And having flown with, I think, both of you, uh, you realize that uh, as perilous as the roads might be, I might prefer <laughs> the roads. <laughs> I think your fellow passengers might say the same. You are not an easy flyer hunt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's uh, there's seven million people hitting the air or hitting the airways. So uh, wow, plan your plan your time accordingly. Good. So so is that your Christmas present? Is your your trip or what are you uh, getting and what are you looking for this this holiday season? Well, I was going to give you what I've given you for 25 years, Christy, which is my high regard and affection. You've always said that's not <laughs> enough. Could you do a little bit better? Uh, so I uh, treasure it. Uh, I treasure it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got a, a lot of things for my family. For the country, it's very easy to know what I want for Christmas, and that's to get a new president in <laughs> 10 and a half months. James is, is a new president also on your uh, Christmas oh, wish God. list. <laughs> is that not, it's on my off life wish list, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh no, it's uh, but I love this time of year. It, you know, particularly down here, the weather's good, and it's just a, it's a, it's just a wonderful time of year, all the way up and down. And if we, if we win the games, it's even better. So this is more of your uh, happy football season um, time of year, rather than your your merry Christmas time of year. Yeah, I think so. I think this year <laughs> in particular. All right. Well, I merry love Christmas. Christmas too. I uh, think it's, yeah. I think it's the best. Holiday, we have a wonderful time. Uh, we uh, do things like go to Mark Shields on Christmas Eve and then have a big day on Christmas. So it's going to be fun, even if, if I can survive uh, the airplane flights. I love it. Well, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's, guys. I'll see you uh, after the holiday break with my New Year's resolutions, oh. and I'll talk to you All then. All right. Okay, Chrissy. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe, rate, and review. Be generous. This podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Happy holidays to everyone. See you next week.